Right. I'm, I'm being told to start if, if I feel like it. Um, so let's begin. So yes, so I am Sean Tucker. Uh, I am Professor of Late Roman and Byzantine History at Cardiff University. It's uh, nice to see so many people coming along to the session and see some familiar names. Um, shout out to Margaret Mallet there, who taught me in Belfast uh, as an undergraduate. Um, so it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, and by this stage you all know the format. So I'll be introducing our author today. Um, just a reminder that um, we'll be taking questions in the Q and A. Um, so just type them in there. So keep microphones off. Um, <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure. To, to introduce Nick, who's a colleague at Cardiff University, Nicholas Baker Bryan, um, who is uh, somebody I've known for, for many years, ever since I first came to Cardiff. And he is somebody who um, is a colleague, uh, but also a collaborator. We've worked together uh, on various projects and continue to do so. For instance, uh, Julian is author and the Sons of Constantine volume. Um, but he does his solo work as well. He's an expert on the Manichaeans um, and he's edited other volumes as well. So the Companion to Religion in Late Antiquity and then the special edition of the Studio Patristica uh, as well. Um, so we're here uh, today to focus on his book on Constantius II. Um, and Constantius II is, is somebody I find fascinating <laughs> for a long time anyway. Uh, so, so it's great to see a book devoted to him. Um, and Constantius II, he is somebody who's sort of suffered uh, from sort of being sandwiched <laughs> between his father, Constantine the Great, and then his, his cousin, not his nephew, his cousin, uh, Julian. Um, uh, so he tends to be shadowed, overshadowed by these these maybe more famous men. Um, he also obviously has a, a reputation problem as well. Um, he is sort of often portrayed as the villain to, to Julian's hero, including by Julian himself, of course. And then uh, as a Christian, he's kind of presented as being kind of on the wrong side of the Christian camp as well. So he kind of lacks um, supporters. Um, there are some, of course, but uh, that's been part of his image problem. Um, and of course, the, the image of him in the, in the history of Ammianus Marcellinus is kind of been fundamental and kind of perceptions of his character, of his reign. Um, but one of the things I like about Nick's book in particular is sort of uh, bringing out the wealth of evidence that we have for Constantius. So it's kind of been more uh, broad uh, drawing on the material we have for this very important reign. Um, there's no doubt that um, he's the most successful son of Constantine and he's a critical figure in the fourth century. Um, so I shall hand over to Nick to tell us more about the book. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. <clears throat> um, well, it's nice to see everybody, so many people, and many thanks to Petros for organizing this mammoth event. It can't be easy, so uh, so thank you for arranging this. Um, so I'll try and share my screen now. Hopefully that will work. Is that showing? Can you can you all see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, what's what's the book about really? So it's it's called the um, the reign of. Uh, so I seem to have got a glitchy camera for some reason. Let me just turn it off and come on again. Okay, let's try that. So it's called the reign of Constantius II and. Um, Uh, it's, a, it's a thematic and um, historical chronological study of um, 
this emperor Constantius II one of Constantine's sons. So in terms of in terms of the details, it actually covers the period uh, immediately following the death of. Sorry, I've got this glitchy camera. I can't seem to stop that. There we are. Okay, let's try that. It covers the period immediately after the death of uh, Constantine I in May three three seven, and runs all the way up to um, the death of Constantius at the end of three six one. Um, although the book's called the Reign of Constantius II, it, that might be that might be a, a case of mis-selling because uh, the book does cover the reigns of the other sons of Constantine by the Empress Fausta. Um, including the eldest son, uh, Constantine II, whose reign was very brief. Um, he died in uh, 340 during a, a, a poorly documented and, and poorly understood conflict with uh, the younger son, Constance. There's also then the middle son, Constantius II, who reigns for a, a, you know, a healthy, a healthy period in the context of uh, fourth century and later Roman history. And then um, the reign of the youngest brother, Constance, um, who dies in 350 um, as the result of a civil war, which we'll talk about briefly. So um, although three, the three sons do get coverage in the book, uh, Constantius II predominates primarily because he's the longest reigning uh, emperor and uh, the sources are perhaps um, the richest. Um, I've just turned my camera off slightly, Sean, because it's, 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 it's glitching, but it's, uh, it's putting me off slightly. Um, so Constantius II reigns for the, the longest period of time. And of course, the source base for that reign is, is going to be uh, uh, the most detailed, although there are serious problems with the sources, as Sean's already pointed out. So in terms of the period itself, and particularly the reign of Constantius, yes, indeed, uh, the emperor has su suffered from some considerable historical and critical neglect largely because uh, Constantius and his brothers are sandwiched between um, two historical giants, for want of a better expression, of the fourth century. So of course, um, Constantine and later, and very briefly, Julian, who is indeed a Constantinian. So um, the underlying premise of the book and the project more broadly was really, um, I, I was interested in Julian initially, and um, I felt that this period of time, over 20 years really, uh, for the reign of Constantius was neglected considerably. Um, and that really, without better understanding the reign of Constantius II, um, we, we risked really having a, a fairly incomplete picture of the fourth century without some you know, critical appreciation of what that period represents and also um, the significance of the reigns of Constantine's immediate successes. So that's a very, very brief review book. Um, in terms of where the book sits in relation to other projects, well, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to see Sean here today because Sean has been instrumental in um, driving forward a number of these projects, which I think ultimately can be reduced to uh, you know, a project on the Constantinians, on the Constantinian dynasty um, per se. So um, yeah, we were prim primarily together interested in Constantine's successes. And this started initially um, with a co-edited volume published now in 2012. Can you believe that, Sean? So long ago, um, called Emperor and Author, which looked at um, um, most of, if not all, of the writings by Julian um, in sequence, I think. Did we do it in sequence? I can't quite remember now. Anyway, um, and that came out, as I said, in, in 2012 with Classical Press of Wales. Um, this was then followed a few years later by another co-edited volume with Sean called The Sons of Constantine. So um, that's fairly straightforward and clear in relation to, to the title. That, that's a book that looked at the reigns of Constantine's sons, including Constantius II, from a variety of perspectives. So um, in relation to the political culture of the Constantinians, um, uh, the, the philosophical, educational culture of the period, um, the issue with the cities um, and urbanism, um, religion, obviously that plays a key, key role in this period and, and received coverage in that book, but also more broadly, 
the significance of the Constantinians as a dynasty in their own right. And a dynasty which is uh, politically uh, and personally very fraught in periods. So um, the monograph really came out of those two projects um, and the idea of writing a book dedicated to uh, Constantius and the other brothers alone came out of a panel which Sean and I and a few other people organised at the Celtic Classics Conference at the University of Bordeaux in September 2012. And it took around 10 years to complete, so it, it, was, a, it was a slow burning project uh, interrupted on numerous occasions by university duties, administrative duties, teaching, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it took slightly longer than I'd hoped, but, but anyway, it's out there now. So, In terms of the structure of the book, um, well, there are nine chapters, um, beginning with an introduction, so looking at the Roman Empire, so uh, considering in particular this notion of the long third century, so looking at the condition of the empire, Beginning in uh, or beginning with the, the end point of the Tetrarchy and running all the way up to um, the emergence of uh, Julian's sole rule as Augustus. Um, and then chapters two and three look in um, fine detail, really, at the sources. So the sources for this period are uh, relatively bountiful, but nevertheless deeply problematic, particularly from the point of view of. Um, picking your way through the representational difficulties of the Constantine emperors, specifically Constantius II, who, as Sean has mentioned, suffers from a, I guess you could call a reputation problem uh, from all sides. Um, so trying to understand uh, and, and unpick the emergence and, and development of uh, portrayals of Constantius II is a, is a key theme in those chapters. Um, Chapter two looks in some detail at material culture, I guess, um, specifically coinage. And there's a nice example of one of the famous uh, Feltem rep, Felix Temporum Reparatio, literally something like the return of the good times, coin from the 340s, which were very significant for that period. Um, and chapter three then looks more at the sort of panegyrics and, and literary and uh, historiographic sources for the, for the period. So then chapter four, um, looks at or considers the dynastic context for the Constantinians, uh, the way in which Constantine I created a dynasty, I guess you could say, uh, and all the perils and pitfalls that emerged in the period following his death, not least the fact that his sons appear to have rejected his own dy dynastic settlement. Um, chapter five then looks at um, a really crucial period, I guess, but a period, a decade, which is largely um, undervalued, underrepresented in, in historiography. So this is the period from um, the death of Constantine II all the way up to the death of Constans. And this is a period which is generally considered to be uh, riven by interpersonal and ecclesiastical disputes. Um, and the book paints perhaps an alternative or a slightly different picture to this uh, standard interpretation. Chapter six then looks at the issue of usurpation. So um, this period in the fourth century, in a sense, is no different from earlier decades in the third and, and fourth century, where we see patterns of usurpation appearing all the time, uh, notably um, with the appearance of this character Magnentius, who deposes Constans and stands against Constantius II as, as really a very effective emperor in his own right in the Western Empire. So chapter six tackles the question of civil war in, in the broadest sense. Chapter seven then looks at the emergence of um, Constantius as an emperor in his own right after the defeat of Magn Magnentius uh, in the late summer of 353 and the way he goes about consolidating both his own reputation but also his imperial image in this period. Uh, chapter eight focuses on um, the final years of Constantius II's reign, which were fairly fraught, even by um, fourth century standards, not least because the Sasanians are uh, fairly active in this period. So Constantius has to deal with uh, all sorts of threats along Rome's eastern frontier, but also famously because this is the period that the Christian factionalism 
of the time reaches a pinnacle, really, and there's all sorts of uh, uh, disputes and wars appear, uh, 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 conflicts breaking out, episcopally speaking, alongside uh, the war against the Sasanians. So poor old Constantius has a very hard time in this, uh, in this chapter. And then um, chapter nine really just looks at uh, the details of Constantius's death, the reporting of um, Constantius's funeral in Gregory, and also uh, the immediate aftermath of, of the, the demise of the Constantinian dynasty following the death of Julian and the rise of this curious figure, Procopius. Uh, so that's an overview of the book. That's what the book looks like. Um, in terms of main contribution, how am I doing for time, Sean? Am I okay? A couple of minutes. Um, well, um, there, there are many excellent studies of, of, of this period already out there. Um, going all the way back, really, I guess we could uh, talk about Richard Klein's book in 1977, which is still very useful. Um, but just to note here, um, the contributions of uh, Timothy Barnes in 93, uh, Pedro Barcello from 2004, uh, Pierre Maraval's um, study of, of, of the Constantinian Empress from 2013, and most recently Muriel Moses' book on uh, Constantius from an Eastern, or uh, uh, yeah, from well, from a largely Eastern perspective. So my book is slightly different from these other studies in the sense that I try to give equal weight to um, what we, I guess, would look on as somewhat as a false division, but the the distinction between uh, sacred and, and secular aspects of the reign. In addition to talking about um, uh, or trying to apply recent research on the representational terms of the, the development and the consolidation of uh, portrayals, both generated by emperors and their, uh, and their uh, courts uh, specifically, but also uh, historiographic evaluations of images of emperors. Um, and um, I'm very interested in sources. That's, that's one of the things I'm very interested in. So I, I try and unpick and explain the emerging historiography of, of Constantius II, especially. Um, in thematic and historical terms, though, I try to uh, shed a little more light on this, um, I guess we could call it a dark age of the 340s, when the two Constantinian brothers are reigning, one in the West and one in the East, um, a period which uh, has suffered from neglect largely because there's no reliable narrative historiography for this period. So Ammianus only really kicks in in 353. Um, we have uh, Zosimus and, and later we have Zonaras for this period, but uh, the narrative historiography for the 340s is limited. So there's a lot of work there uh, in the book on um, legal constitutions, but, but also coinage and, and panegyric for that period. I'm also interested in the book in uh, unpicking relations with the Sasanians, so uh, trying to understand the long-term impact of foreign wars in this period, and also civil wars on the direction that the empire takes in the 340s, 350s and 360s and beyond. Um, and I guess the standout contribution, it's Perhaps it's not that revolutionary, but really the empire of the Constantinian was functional. It was functional as a unity to a point, and it was clearly a Christian empire, um, uh, as seen most evidently in the legislation that's issued at the time. So um, I think that's it, actually.